Okay. Um, so for next Monday, we, 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 you should try these three problems. So the first one is on the uh, Lagrange multipliers. And these two are about the motion in, uh, in a central force that uh, we are going to discuss uh, today uh, on Friday. So wait for the weekend before you try to solve those two. And then I have a fourth problem that uh, is not uh, this nice feature that uh, uh, problems uh, for which the potential only depends on the relative distance between uh, your uh, uh, bodies, so central forces. Uh, and then if you look at the two-body problem, that can be reduced in a systematic manner to a one-body problem, you remember, in which uh, uh, you have, uh, <coughs> sorry, in which the, the Lagrangian then uh, becomes, uh, uh, so two bodies, uh, one of mass M1 and uh, one of mass M2, then if you write a big uh, capital R, uh, the the position of the center of the mass of the, of the system of the two bodies, uh, the Lagrangian has a term that is just the, uh, the kinetic energy as if all the mass of the system had, 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 has been concentrated <coughs> at its center of the mass, plus a term with this uh, 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 reduced mass that is defined as the, the sum of the reciprocal uh, quantities, uh, uh, 1 over mu, 1 over plus uh, m, uh, uh, m1 plus 1 over m2. Uh, and the velocity is taken, uh, uh, so I have two points, 1 and 2, and this is r, and then somewhere is the center of the mass, and this is big R. Okay. Uh, and then, because it's a central force problem, uh, you have your uh, uh, potential uh, that, uh, that uh, we haven't specified yet. Uh, this will be the next step. But uh, we know that it's a central force. Therefore, the potential can only, uh, can only depend uh, uh, on, the, on the relative distance, little r. Okay. So that was the, what, uh, we, uh, where, where we stop. Uh, on Monday, no, uh, last week. Uh, so now uh, I want to, uh, well, uh, maybe I should remind you that uh, uh, clearly uh, there is no explicit dependence of capital R, and therefore, uh, one more time, uh, I know that uh, there is a, a conserved quantity, right, that is the conjugate, uh, the momentum that is conjugate to the, to the missing uh, uh, cyclic uh, uh, coordinate, and this is clearly the momentum of the system as a whole, uh, uh, right, uh, because uh, uh, the force is only, in a way, an internal force, right, because it acts on the two components, and therefore, uh, this, the, the system as a whole uh, um, has the momentum in, uh, in, uh, in space uh, conserved, okay? So it may move uh, with constant speed, and if that is the case, it will keep moving with constant speed, or it, it is at rest, maybe, with respect to some uh, frame of reference. I, I don't care. Uh, uh, that we already said. I mean, this is, in fact, the case. If you look at the system uh, uh, sun earth uh, the center of the mass is somewhere close to to the sun and we we don't really care i mean you know that the system that our solar system is moving very fast toward the the uh, the, the virgo i think uh, some uh, some cluster is very far away is moving very fast in that direction it has been moving this way roughly with constant speed, and uh, okay, it doesn't matter, right, because uh, we, 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 this is true as seen from an a observer that he, uh, who is at rest with respect to, 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 to our galaxy and the Virgo cluster, 
but for us, uh, we, we are not, uh, we, I mean, we, we are riding on top of our galaxy, so uh, for us, it, it, is, it is the same as if they were at rest, the center of a mass, okay? Uh, actually, it's even more complicated, you understand, I mean, because uh, we, we are in the solar system, the solar system is moving within the galaxy, and the galaxy, our galaxy itself, is moving in that direction, in another direction. And, and then the cluster of galaxies to which we belong itself is moving in some other direction that I don't know. But uh, the nice thing is that as long as they move uh, with constant speed, it doesn't really matter. This is what uh, Galileo, uh, Galilei taught, at, uh, taught us, well, not us, but uh, whoever was around at the time, uh, that uh, physics is invariant under those transformations. Now, next, next, next year, w when I, I will be teaching you uh, electrodynamics, we will see that, uh, well, probably you already know, that this is not completely true because uh, physics is not invariant under the Galilean transformations, is, uh, is invariant under uh, Einstein, right, the relativistic transformations. But uh, as I said, uh, already as long as the velocities are small compared to, to, to the velocity of light, uh, this uh, Galilean invariance uh, of inertial uh, systems is a very good uh, uh, approximation. And that's also the reason why we can, well, we don't have a laboratory class here, uh, that's a pity, I mean, uh, so we cannot do experiments, but uh, all experiments you can try at home or here uh, with a very good approximation, uh, it, it, the, the solution, what, what you see is what you would see if you uh, uh, were at rest, right? You don't see any acceleration around because the Earth is rotating. Uh, as I already said, I mean, you, you in fact, you need some very specific effects, and, and we will study those when we talk about the rigid body. There are ways to see we actually are, uh, we, we are rotating. You, you know that, right? Do, do you know how, how do, you, do we know that? I mean, okay, the sun uh, goes uh, around, but uh, it could be the other way around, right? Uh, as people thought at the beginning. I mean, it, we could be at rest and the sun moves around. So how do we know that, in fact, uh, it is us uh, rotating? I mean, everybody knows that uh, is the lap. I mean, it's not the first case. But uh, uh, how would you, I mean, I, I, you know, there are these, uh, some people don't believe. I mean, they think that the Earth is, is flat a and the sun goes around. So how do you convince these people that, in fact, that's not the case? I mean, the fact that the Earth is not flat is, is rather simple, no? because you look, stare far away and you see that something on the sea uh, you know, disappear slowly, uh, beginning with the, the lowest part. If you look at uh, 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 some sailing ship, right? That's, uh, so that's pretty convincing, at least for me. Uh, th th there is some curvature, and the thing is disappearing. So probably the Earth is not flat. But to convince somebody that, in fact, we are rotating, you need some uh, something more. Uh, so you you don't. So why do you believe that? Uh, that uh, the sun is at rest and we are going around. We are rotating. Because they told you or not. But you should always, you know, you shouldn't take uh, nobody's word for, I mean, you should check. Okay, we will come to that later on. So now, uh, now that we have reduced the, the two-body, one-two-body problem to, to the much simpler one-body problem, you see, it's just one. I, now I look only at this part of, the, of my Lagrangian. This uh, sort uh, I forget about uh, is just uh, the center of a mass that moves with some constant velocity in some direction, okay? Good, uh, but uh, now for me the Lagrangian is just this, and it, you see, is a one-body, uh, uh, is a one-body uh, problem. It's just uh, that I have this funny-looking mass that, uh, uh, however, is just uh, you know, once I give you the two masses of the two bodies, then I can compute this uh, reduced mass. I plug in here, and I have a one-body problem. Uh, Ah, okay, very good. Uh, for instance, 
Right. That's Newton argument, right? Yeah. But, but how, how would you do that uh, for, for us here on the Earth? I mean, that shows that uh, the vessel is, is uh, rotating, right? D did you understand what he said? If you, put, if you have a, a bucket full of water, right? Uh, if you sort of spin in, in this way, you see that the surface of the bucket, right, uh, it doesn't stay flat. It, it goes like this because you have a, a force pulling uh, away the, the centrifugal force, right? But, right. But how would you apply that for, for us on the Earth? I, I, we don't see the sea going like this, right? A, a, it is not the tides, you know, the tidal motions. Uh. OK, think about it. We, we, uh, we will discuss that. I mean, this was a big issue uh, at a certain point. People really thought hard. For instance, Newton, I mean, this is an argument for the absolute frame of reference. You know, Newton argued that uh, you can d establish this this way. OK. Um, so now let, let's just look at this term here. Let's, in fact, erase this. Di uh, uh, that we don't. That's all uh, we need. And in fact, I, I even don't need this this sketch any longer because now I really want to think of a, a single body with the reduced mass moving under the, the, the effect of this potential. And uh, uh, so it's a body there. I'm, if, if I'm sitting somewhere at the, so the, the picture now is, here is the origin for this uh, vector r. And I have a, a reduced mass body here moving in some way. A, a, and I have a force pointing toward this uh, point, right, given by the gradient of that potential. So this is the is the is the center force problem. Also, maybe I should, uh, if you take the system Earth, Earth Sun, you see that uh, if you have a very right, you see what happened that uh, uh, if you have uh, two masses, the size of which are very different, then uh, one of the two dominates, right? Because if you put here a very large mass and here a very light one, right, uh, this mu goes like m1 times m2 divided by the, the sum, right? And then you see that if one is very heavy, then uh, you, know, you, you can neglect this one. So now assume that m1 is much smaller than m2, then you can neglect this with comp with respect to this, then these two simplify, and you only have the light mass enter in the equation. So if I'm thinking of our planet with respect to the sun, uh, the, the, the light guy, it's us. And so here I can put the, the, the mass of, of the Earth with a very good approximation. There are corrections, but there are more. Um, so uh, it's just one vector, OK? and. Uh, uh, what is the symmetry of this problem? I think uh, now we, we go hunting for conserved quantities, right? Time, yes, very good. That's, uh, there is no explicit dependence on time. So I expect the energy of the system to be conserved. But also, you see, it only depends on, on, uh, on R, right? So you, you do expect a, 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 a spherical symmetry, right, don't you? You see, there is no explicit dependent on, uh, on uh, angles, or it's just R. <coughs> Again, because I'm assuming that it's a central force, right? If this, if it has, actually, I mean, I should put something like this to be more precise. It only depends on the, on the distance, not uh, if it's here or rather there. Therefore, I do expect some uh, spherical symmetry, and therefore, I, I, what spherical symmetry tells me that I have a conserved quantity that is the angular momentum, right? That usually is defined as R cross P, where P is the momentum of this uh, guy. 
you know this, uh, this symbol, right? So it's a cross product of two vectors. That there are two ways to, to, to multiply vectors, as you know. Uh, one produces a scalar, and one produces another vector. And this is the, 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 the lar. I mean, you have take two vectors, and you produce a, a new vector. Uh, and you know how uh, you know that there is this rule to that the ter they are all sort of orthogonal to each other. If you have two vectors, they identify a pl plane, and then this is sticking out from that plane. Okay, this is going to be important. So, in other words, you see that because so this I say is conserved, right? Because of the spherical symmetry. So. So I have two conserved quantity, at least, the energy and the uh, angular momentum. Th they are really four, right? Because you should look at the component. So the angular momentum is conserved in uh, three directions. And because of this, you see that uh, because of the definition of vector product, this implies that uh, <coughs> the, 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 the little r right, is always orthogonal to big L. Right, because by definition, if R and P, say, are uh, two vectors in the plane of the blackboard, and if you have two vectors, you can always identify this plane, right? And then uh, I guess uh, it's the right hand uh, uh, is like this, so actually it's pointing that way, right? You agree? Okay. <laughs> And, and you see, anyway, is pointing uh, uh, inside the, the the blackboard. Therefore, it's orthogonal to R. And also, that means that uh, this uh, the, the motion of this particle, because of this property, is always in a plane. That's very interesting. Because of the the, the nature of this force, uh, if you have this particle moving, it's not going to move like this is always moving in an orbit that stays in a plane. In other words, you can always define a plane in which your orbit is going to, to stay. And it's going to stay there. For instance, again, let's take our favorite uh, system, that is the solar system. The sun and the earth, the earth moves, but it moves in a way, or if you want, the sun is moving, whatever you prefer. Uh, uh, but it's always moving in a plane, okay? It's not, I mean, it's not doing something like this to a, to a very good approximation. That's a huge simplification, you understand, because from a three-dimensional problem, we are, uh, you know, we are moving toward a two-dimensional problem, okay? And in fact, it just, <coughs> what is that? it just happens that uh, uh, Almost all planets are very close to the same plane, right? So they could be, you know, they could be all askew, because this is only tell you, telling you that uh, for each of them you can identify a plane, and then it moves in that plane. But as a matter of fact, because of the initial conditions and the dissipation that you have in the system, really we are almost all in the plane, this ecliptic plane, so that Mars, Venus, Jupiter. Uh, Saturn, they are very close to all moving in the plane, and that plane is very, to a very good approximation, the same. That's why when you see pictures of our system, you see all the planets aligned in a way. That's not obvious at all. Uh, I mean, uh, why Mars is not going like this and the Earth like that? From this, they could do it. The point is that they interact. Uh, I mean, there are high order effects because it clearly it's not a two body problem. Once you put in all the, well, how many are the eight or nine planets that, uh, that we have, uh, so they tend to dissipate if they are not in the same plane. And so they, that what the final situation uh, uh, looks like, I think. Uh, I'm not sure actually about this. But for us, uh, 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 this is a huge simplification. So I, I said we have four conserved quantity. Now I'm going to spend one of them, that is this, uh, and I reduce my uh, degrees of freedom from three, okay, to two. Okay, so I spend one by by using this conservation to assume that the motion is taking place taking place in a plane. 
So in fact, how many coordinates uh, do I need? This is, a, in principle, I have a, 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 a three polar coordinates, right? It's a spherical problem, three po polar coordinates. That usually, well, let's agree on the names of these things. Uh, they have historical names. Well, one, of course, is, the, is, the, is this modulus uh, of, the, of the R. So this is the obvious, the radial distance. And then, uh, given the radial distance, all you need is the same number of coordinates that you need in order to identify a star, for instance. Now, if you go uh, on the internet, I guess now, uh, in the old days, there, there were books in which you had the position of all stars uh, every day in the year. They, well, obviously, they won't give you the R because that uh, doesn't matter. You're just standing here and looking. All you need are two angles, right? You need to be told in which direction to look for the star, or for the sun, or for the moon, for that matter, right? And then how, uh, or what height you should look to see it, right? So you see, you need two angles. This angle, and this angle is called the, uh, uh, I guess the, so let me call it theta and psi. And, uh, uh, so this angle in the plane, I call it the azimuth angle. And the other one uh, is the zenith angle. I guess because the zenith is the direction right above. But you understand that uh, uh, through in spherical coordinates, I need three coordinates. But because I'm spending this one out of four conserved quantity, I can get rid of one of these. And uh, usually, you get rid of this one. I fix it to be pi over 2. And that is good, because this way, this angle is fixed. It's the zenith. So it, it is perpendicular, the direction perpendicular to the plane in which the motion is taking place. Okay? So this is fixed. I don't have to worry about that, and I, 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 because, uh, as I said, the motion uh, is taking place in a plane. Actually, you understand that I, I have used more than one. I, I really use two of these, because if I say that something it is moving in a plane, I, I've fixed two angular momenta here, right? And uh, the only one left is the one in the, in the plane, right? So really, I've spent two out of four. So I'm still left with two first integrals, and I'm going to use them to solve the problem. OK? Is this clear? So I'm inching my way toward solving this problem. So now I have introduced my, my coordinates. So since I've introduced my coordinates, I can write the, the Lagrangian in a more uh, appealing way. Uh, so essentially, I'm in polar coordinates, right? Because that's what I've done. So let me erase this. So since from now on, we, uh, we always mean that we are dealing with the reduced mass. Let me call the reduced mass little m, because I don't like to write mu all the time. So uh, then the Lagrangian is the one I wrote before, except that I, I write m. I like it better than mu, but it is mu. And then I write the kinetic energy in polar coordinates, because I hope I convince you that uh, this is OK, because uh, the motion of the planet is taking plane, place in a plane. And this, by now, I hope you, you know by heart how to write the kinetic energy in the, in, the, in the polar coordinates. And then I have my potential that clearly, by definition, of central force can only depend on r, not on theta, uh, uh, even less on, on psi, the zenith angle. So now, back to the conservation laws. Uh, I said that I have four, two I've used. Now I can identify, again, that I have the energy, of course, because you see there is no T dependence. And now I can identify the one remaining component of the angular momentum that is conserved in this system. Because by inspection, there is no theta, uh, explicit theta dependence. Therefore, if I take 
the derivative of my, uh, of my Lagrangian with respect to theta, right? This is clearly 0. And uh, by Noether, the Noether theorem, the derivative of my Lagrangian with respect to theta naught must vanish as well. And this quantity is conserved. And this quantity is what? Well, we are actually, we already met this guy in some of the problems we discussed uh, during the, uh, the problem section or, or before. So I call this p theta, that is the conjugate momentum to my uh, theta coordinate. And, and you see that it's just m, right? m r square theta. And so this is the remaining third component of the angular momentum that is conserved, that two I've used here, the one I'm using here. A and uh, uh, so the equation of motion for this I I is trivial. It's just this one. P dot theta is simply vanish, zero. So that means I, I can give a name to this. I already given the name here, but uh, usually by by convention, this thing is also called the, the angular momentum, right? Uh, that component. So it's also p theta is usually indicated as little l. So we will switch to, from one to the other, and uh, so this fact that l define a, I'm r square theta dot is conserved. So this this quantity is conserved is the conservation of uh, angular momentum for our system. Actually, this was observed, uh, for instance, uh, you, you know this uh, Kepler second law? Do you remember this? I mean, it's hard to remember because uh, but this is a, 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 in a way, you see this, this, uh, this quantity, it's close to be the aerial velocity, right? You, you understand what, what, say if you have a trajectory like this, and uh, uh, you have r, right? You see that this, this is r d theta, if this is d theta, right? The infinitesimal. So if I write uh, one half r squared, uh, uh, one half r square d theta, right? This is the, the 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 area that you have here, the infinitesimal area. So you see, this is uh, essentially this quantity here, right? Because if you take d t, d t, except for for a constant, that doesn't matter because everything is constant, right? So the conservation of the angular momentum uh, for Kepler was uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, the area, area swept, no? the area swept out by the, the, the radius along the orbit, OK, for unit of time is, is constant. This was called the Kepler second uh, law, I guess. Uh, very important uh, because it's a property of the orbit. And he, 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 now in modern terminology is just a, a consequence of the conservation of the angular momentum. Okay? So for Kepler was this fact that the area swept uh, uh, in, in a unit time uh, was constant. So the, the planet was moving in such a way that this quantity, uh, this area uh, remained constant. In our language, the, the, the planet moves in such a way that the angular momentum is conserved. That is somehow more a more interesting way to put uh, but of course Kepler didn't have the Lagrangian and all you know we are standing on on the shoulder of a much bigger man okay so how far can I go without telling you what is V so I guess this is the the question and actually I can go uh, on 
because now we can do another thing. We can uh, 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 go back to the other conserved quantity. Remember that uh, we have the energy and then the angular momentum. Now the angular momentum is, has been taken care. But I can also write the energy now. So th this, you, you, you remember. Uh, and you remember the energy is going to be uh, uh, well, it's essentially T plus V, right? You, you, you should write DL, D, uh, theta dot minus L. And if you do that, you see that you get essentially, because you, you have like, a, 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 you know, you, you switch the sign of the V, so the energy or the Hamiltonian, as we, we will call it uh, uh, later on, is just this. OK, do you all agree? So uh, you see, I can write this. And I can also do a little trick. Because you see, I can really get rid now of this constant, uh, of this variable altogether. Because I know that theta dot, whatever it is, right? multiplied by this is a constant. So I can exploit this conservation law to write theta dot to be L over m r square, and then plug in back there. And this is very nice, because now I have that the energy is only a function of r. So I've reduced my three-dimensional problem to a one-dimensional problem. And as I already said, one-dimensional problems are nice, because we really know how. We, we really see what's going on. So let's do that. So I have m over 2, right? Then I have r dot square. And this term here, I, I substitute for theta dot the square of this. So I get l square, right? Then divide by m uh, square, but I have m over 2, right? So I can just keep, uh, just keep uh, uh, 1 m. Uh, and then r to the r to the uh, to the fourth, but then I have r square, so I just have r square. So essentially, I have this kinetic term, then this, and then whatever plus because the energy uh, is there. This is the energy of your system. And as I said, this is really a one-dimensional, 1D one problem now, because uh, I only have one uh, trajectory uh, that is r, r as a function of t. Okay. So clearly, I cannot solve the differential equation as long as I don't say something more about v uh, of r. But still, I can uh, have a, a qualitative discussion of something. Uh, that helps me in understanding the, the solutions. Because you see, uh, this term here, we will call it the, the effective potential. Because you see, it's the, part, it's the only part that depends uh, on r. So I, I sort of, everything that depends on the velocity, I, I sort of call it the kinetic energy. And then what is left is the potential, OK? and, and uh, uh, and this, this all quantity is conserved. Therefore, the velocity that is r dot, so I call it v, OK, v equal r dot, I guess that this is a definition, can be rewritten if you take, uh, you know, you take this, uh, everything on the other side, OK? And you see that this is just the square root 2 over m, that is this term I have here. Then I took uh, the, the effective potential on the other side. So I have E minus the effective potential. So the velocity at each instant time is given by this expression. And you see that uh, because this is a square root, 
I mean, this quantity must always be positive, right? If this becomes negative, you get an imaginary velocity that we said is no good. I mean, in classical mechanics, all quantities are, are real. I mean, this is not quantum mechanics. Everything is real. So you, you get the sort of constraint. And now if you, if you draw the effective potential, for instance, you see this is a very nice way to discuss in a qualitative manner a, a problem. You can, in a way, uh, draw some conclusions. Let's, let's do that. Let's take a, a simple example that uh, will come out uh, again later on. So let's take the, the Kepler problem. That is the problem in which the central force, in which the central force is Newton, uh, gravitational, universal gravitational force. This means the, the potential is minus some constant, 1 over r, right? This, by any way, is going to be the most relevant case. Uh, uh, so, uh, so then uh, you see that uh, uh, here you, have to, you can plot the, the, the effective potential. Right, <coughs> and uh, on the other, so you, uh, the R, and uh, then you have uh, well, the effective potential is made uh, is made of two parts now, right? Because I have uh, L square two m R square minus this k over R, so I can I, I can draw the potential actually the effective potential, but let's draw first the two terms. So how, how is this term, uh, uh, so this, this is the, 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 the zero. So how, if I want to draw the Kepler potential, uh, how, how, how is it? How, how, how does it go here? Help, help, help me out. So it's, it's a 1 over r with a minus. So it, it should be here. So let's start from infinity. Uh, given the finite size of the blackboard, infinity is here. No, there. And then it goes like what? <laughs> like this, right? So this is the minus k over r. But you see the effective potential is the sum of these two terms. So you do also have a positive term that, in fact, is a little sharper than 1 over r. That means that it goes a little bit. So the other one goes like this, right? 1 over r squared. So this is l, l squared 2 m r squared. And the effective potential is the combination of these two. So you can <coughs> combine them uh, uh, together. But you see that uh, because this is, this is r squared, so it's a little flatter than r, right? So it starts out where this is larger. So it starts out following the, the 1 over r, right? But at a certain point, this guy starts becoming bigger when, when r is smaller than 1 and becoming closer to 0. Now this one goes to infinity, to plus infinity, faster than this guy goes to minus. So the potential is going to be something. It goes down. Then it, 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 it remembers that there was the other term. And so eventually it goes up, up like that. So this is, a, the, this is the, the effective potential. So the angular momentum is acting as a sort of effective potential, a correction to the effective potential, right? Because you see that uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you start out with zero angular momentum, that is the case if you drop from here to the sun with zero angular momentum, with zero velocity uh, except in the radial direction, then you would see only this potential, right? But because in general, for arbitrary initial conditions, you do not follow this trajectory. You always have some component of your velocity away from the radial distance. What the effect, you see an effective potential. You move as if the potential had been this one. In fact, this is what you have. And therefore, the potential is dramatically different because instead of going to minus infinity, here actually goes to plus infinity. And you understand that this is as for instance, can you reach the sun? Can you reach the sun at all? Right. So, but you cannot beat this, right? Because it goes to infinity. 
So unless you have zero angular momentum, there is no way that starting from here, you can fall on the sun. Because you see, you have an infinite barrier here. That's highly non-trivial. I mean, people think that you know, if, if, if they are on a spaceship and they are kicked out, then they will fall on the sun. <laughs> and that's it. You know, they burn to hell. Actually, it's very difficult. You, you, you need the special conditions to hit the, the things. And in fact, this is a way that we can start. And cl uh, I'm sorry. Yes. This this is all real. Yes, but as you know, no one can land to the sun. If they should be landing there, no. <laughs> you, you see. There, they should be finding. No, you, you enter an orbit and uh, you go around. In fact, your fate is even more horrible than the because if you have zero angular momentum, okay, you go to hell, but in a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> in the other case, you see, you don't hit the sun. You, you start orbiting around the sun. You see here, OK, I'm drawing just r, and uh, you don't see the other coordinate, because I'm, I'm, I'm translating the problem in a one-dimensional problem. But you must think that for each of these r, you have the theta coordinate. So let, let me finish it. It will become clearer. So this is the effective potential that you have, right? And now you still have to give me the energy that is the other quantity that is conserved. And so uh, the energy is somewhere here, right? For let's start with the energy that is this value, E. As I said, because V is, is this E minus V uh, effective, that's the reason why you start out with this energy at R to infinitely away. Then you come closer to the sun. And then here you have to stop, because if you go here, you get an imaginary velocity, right? Because you see, here the v effective is larger than e. This is less than 0. And the square root of a negative number is imaginary. So if your energy is this one, you, what, what happens to you is that you, you come close, close, close. This is the closest point of approach. Let's call it r0. And then you fly away. Now, we know of many uh, uh, bodies behaving this way. These are the comets, usually. A comet starts out with the energy that is large enough, comes in from very far away. Here's the sun, right? Reaches a point of closest approach, this R0, and then it flies away somewhere. Not all comets. Some comets are on closed orbits simply that are very eccentric, so that they come back after 100 years. But most comets are of this kind here. We just see them once, then they fly away some to I don't know where. And so, so this is this motion. It comes close, and then it goes back in the other co coordinate. If I plug back. The, the full system, right, with r this distance and the theta, this angle here, then you see the, the full trajectory, OK? But the, 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 the crucial information is already in the one-dimensional diagram. You only need the other coordinate to, to visualize what actually is taking place, OK? So it moves in the plane. It comes close to the sun. Then, because of this uh, rule that the v must be real, uh, when it hits this point at which the effective potential, mainly because of the angular momentum, becomes larger than the energy, is forced to come back. So you see, it's a very nice, neat way to uh, uh, understand the solution, even without solving anything. Okay? In fact, that's the best way to understand a differential equation. You, you must have a feeling for the solution, even without or, or after solving the that's the way you really understand it. How about if you have, uh, uh, I mean, the, this is a, a rather large energy. So, OK, you see it's up, up, up there. Uh, what, what do you have a little less energy? Let's say uh, 
so this is a, this, this a orbit in which you don't come back are called unbounded orbits for obvious reasons. But what happens if your energy actually is, 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 is down here, is negative? Yeah, it's, it's trapped, right? It's a bounded up. You see, because it, it cannot actually be at infinity, because there, again, the effective potential is larger than the energy. So it cannot stay there. And it cannot stay here for the same reason. So it can only stay between these two points that are called Ra and Rb. There is no tunneling, if you think of that, if you have done that in quantum mechanics. No tunneling. So that's what uh, this particle has to stay. And what, what is the orbit in this case? So this was this one. How about this one? Well, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, you see, it, here's the sun. Then you have two radii. Let's call it R. A, I say, and R, B, right? A and B. And the orbit, I don't know what happened to this orbit, but it must stay. So it's something like this, right? It goes around like crazy, maybe, or maybe not. It can also, it can also go like this. But uh, this I don't know because I haven't solved the equations. I'm always, but whatever it does, it has to do it between these two, these two lines, these two circles, OK? <coughs> In fact, there is a final case that what happens if the energy is exactly, I mean, here there, there is a minimum somewhere, right? That's the nice thing about this effective potential. If you just look at the Kepler pro potential, you don't have a minimum. And this is another way of saying that you fall on the sun, no matter what. It's an attractive potential, an attractive force, and you end up there. But here there is a minimum. And if I take a, a, an energy that is exactly the one, that is exactly the value of the, uh, of the potential at the minimum, what happened to the velocity that I erased uh, that was here? If the two are exactly equal, then the velocity, the radial velocity, is zero. That means the particle has zero radial velocity. So that means it's a circle, right? So this solution here is exactly a circle. So the, the planet moves on a, a, a fixed distance from the sun, because there is zero radial velocity, and on a circle. So we have classified, in a way, roughly all the possible orbits that can be unbounded or bounded. OK, those, they go to infinity, and those uh, that remain within bounds. And then, depending on the energy, in general, they move in a finite ring uh, about the sun, but for a special, very special initial condition, such that the energy is exactly equal to the effective potential at the minimum, it has an even simpler motion that is in a circle, so fixed radial distance from the sun, and it goes around there for infinity. Ah, OK. You're still. Uh, Eclipses, the, ah, the fact that they are covered. Yeah. I mean, we have solar and then we have lunar eclipse. Yes. So OK. We are, then we see only one if, uh, if we, are, we are just afraid to understand that uh, what it means. Uh, OK, so for the solar one, I, I can, that's the moon coming between uh, us and the sun, right? So that could be very well. But you say for the, for the moon eclipses. Yeah, uh, by, by, by seeing those two eclipses, we can tell who is the rotating and. Can we? So 
the moon because uh, it's only a relative it is the fact that uh, you see the problem is that we have the moon between us and the sun right so all you need is that the moon and the sun move and you have two the two so i mean let's say we are at rest here and then you have the moon and then the sun when the moon is between us and the sun you have uh, a solar eclipse sometimes it's total sometimes it No, because the, the lunar eclipse is, is when you, the, the moon is here, then we are projecting a, a shadow, and then, but you see, I, I'm, I'm at rest. The moon, let's see, the moon, go, the moon goes around, and the sun goes around. If, I'm, if, I, if, I, if, the moon, if the earth is between the sun and the moon, I have a moon eclipse. If the moon is between us and the sun, I have the other. No, I don't think. It's not kinematically, you're not going to, because kinematically <coughs> is completely equivalent. So it's not a kinematical problem, it's a dynamical problem. There is an acceleration that. Uh, By the way, this is a nice coincidence that the moon, the apparent size of the moon, is exactly. You know, the moon is much smaller than the sun. But the distance of the moon with respect to the sun is such that the ap apparent size of the moon is exactly the sun. This was not true 10,000 years ago. It's not going to be true 10,000 years in the future because, you know, the moon is moving a little bit. Okay? But now, right now you have these beautiful things. That, so we are very lucky. And uh, is this a coincidence? Or, you know, this is very often in physics you have this problem. You see something remarkable, and then it could be a coincidence, or it, it, it's the effect of, a, of, a, of, a, of some dynamical principle. You understand? It's like if you have two objects with masses that are an exact ratio. I mean, is this a coincidence? It just happened to be like that? Or it is like that because there is some force, and uh, then the mass is given by this. So that's always the case. It's very important to distinguish between these two things. In this case, it's pretty clear that it's just a coincidence. I mean, we don't see any dynamical reason why the moon should be exactly at that distance and the size of the moon to be. But, uh, you know, you, you, you may think, no, this is the effect of some dynamical process, and so you, you, you have to think about what that is. Uh, in that case, this is a crucial clue, right? You say, ah. This proves that there is a force such that the moon has to stay there. Or it's just a coincidence, so you don't learn anything, and you throw away <laughs> your life <laughs> trying to explain that phenomenon. But this is very common in physics. And it's very important in your training to be able to tell what is a coincidence and what is an important clue. <coughs> but of course, that also changes from, I mean, is the theory that tells you what is a clue and what is a coincidence, right? Uh, <coughs> you know about the precessions of, of the orbits, right? Have you heard about this? <coughs> I mean, the, the orbit is like this, but then there is a precession. You move it. And Mercury, that is the closest planet to the sun, has a, the largest precession. This was known for. But from the point of view of Newtonian mechanics, this was a sort of a coincidence. It was just due to the fact that if you have perturbation or something, then you have precession. You don't have precession if you solve just this problem. Okay? But from the point of view of general relativity, it's due to the fact that this is not the real potential. There are corrections. And those corrections produce precession. So you see, for Newton, it was just a coincidence. For Einstein, it was the clue for the theory of general relativity. So you know, one has to be careful before throwing away things. OK, so that's what I wanted to say. Well, maybe I spent too much time on uh, 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 this idea of solving problems. But you see, it's very effective, very nice. We reduce the problem to a one-dimensional 
uh, system with this effective potential, and then we are able to, to almost, we know the solution. I mean, it's, now it's only a matter of, of working out the details. But of course, uh, uh, the details are important in physics. So let's write the, the equation of motion now. We have the Lagrangian. Let me uh, erase this uh, effective potential. Uh, well, we, all, we only need the, the Lagrangian. That, that's all we need. So, uh, well, uh, I mean, there are many ways to do this. I mean, there are many ways to to skin a cat, they say. Uh, but le let's just write, just, uh, just to show that, uh, le le let's, uh, so uh, first I, I, I write the, uh, so one equation, one equation of motion I already, uh, we, we already know it, right? If I take the, 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 the theta is conserved, right? The theta dot is conserved. So one equation of motion, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of trivial. Let's look at the, uh, the one we haven't looked yet because we have been do fooling around with the effective potential. So now I take the, the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the other coordinate, that is r. There is where all the dynamics is. And again, uh, I can do that uh, just by, ins by inspection. Partial derivative with respect to the velocity, so it's this one. Uh, so I get my m r dot, and of course, I, I immediately dot it again because of the, sec the, of the derivative with respect to time. So this is the acceleration. Then uh, uh, I have the uh, minus the partial derivative, right, of the Lagrangian with respect to r, the coordinate. So I have to take a partial derivative of the. So this is mi minus m, right? Uh, uh, the, the the two kills the, the two theta dot square, okay? Uh, uh, and this is minus dv dr because remember the Lagrangian is not only the kinetic energy; it's also the potential. So uh, I have uh, so this if you uh, and if I use my Second equation that is just the conservation of the angular momentum, I can always rewrite this as L square, as I said, mR cube. Now, so One can try and solve this directly. Uh, in fact, one way is uh, uh, now probably I haven't told you that. Uh, uh, so uh, what we uh, so really you, you can solve this problem in two ways, right? You you can write r as a function of theta, or you can write r and theta as a function of time, right? Usually, the, the, you see, this, these are called the trajectories. That's what I've been talking about all the time. We solved the problem. We found the trajectories, that is, the uh, uh, change in time or, uh, of our generalized coordinates. But for this kind of two-dimensional problem, a very effective way is to write what, so these are trajectories. This is called the orbit. I, I've written one coordinate in terms of the other, and you understand why it's called the orbit. These are trajectory in time, so I, I, I give you, so this is the orbit, so you see this is r theta, r and some theta, I don't know, I start measuring from here. So either I, I give you r of theta, that is this orbit, or for each point I give you r and theta. So there are two different cons, no? Then you bring them together. But the solution, so in this business, 
very often you give the solution in terms of the orbit, as I did here. But in general, you, you give the trajectory. So if I were to solve this equation, you see, by integrating that, I would get r as a function of t. Then, through the conservation law and a further integration, I would get theta as a function of t, so the trajectory. But I can also switch around, exactly because I have this, uh, you see, because I have that uh, L is equal m r squared theta dot, uh, right? That means I have uh, that L dt is equal m r squared d theta. Now, a mathematician will just uh, faint here and, and leave the room because, you see, I, what I'm doing, I just write d theta dt. Then I forget that this is the derivative. I take this piece and I put it there and I leave it there. That's complete nonsense. So maybe we cut this from, from the movie, but it's actually it works, right? I mean, that's the beauty of Leibniz, Leibniz notation. I mean, he wrote it like this, and this like works uh, like, of course, it, it's not correct. You understand? This is a derivative. It's, a, it's not a small theta over a small t. Mathematicians spend most part of the, eight, the of 19th century and, uh, to explain what this is, but we physicists, we don't care, and we do that. Uh, we, they will never stop us until we are dead. <laughs> anyway, but now you see what I can do. I can trade the dependence on t with the one of theta. So I can transform this equation that originally would have given me only r of t in the equation of the orbit. So because of this relation, uh, between theta and time due to the conservation of the angular momentum, I can always switch using the same equation roughly and instead of studying the trajectory, study the orbit directly. So I want to just go and do that uh, 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 if I have time. D did you understand what, uh, what I'm doing or it's complete uh, I'm out of my mind? Do, do, do you feel the same need of doing that, or uh, it's just, uh, you, you see, uh, you understand this. These are two different ways of giving you the solution. It's, it's where I started. I say, you can describe this motion as a, a geometrical object that is this, this is the orbit, or you can tell me at each instant in time the coordinates. There are two, right? Now. In the business of, of the motion of planets, usually, as you know, people talk about orbits. So orbit means that I give you the position r as a function of the angle. So I draw a curve, right? You know this curve for, for, for a circle is such, right? Uh, uh, for a, I don't know, uh, the hyperbole is a different one. We, we study those, the, all those uh, curves. But that's what I want to do. So I don't want to f solve r of t and then theta of t and then the system solve it together to get the orbit. I see that because of this relation, I can trade this equation that is a differential equation uh, 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 with respect to time. I can trade derivative with respect to time with derivative with respect to theta. So then I get the solution. It's directly the orbit. OK, do you want to do that? So let's do it. Uh, was there a question? Uh, ah, yeah, uh, sorry. I, you should stop me. When I what? No, I, this is equal to this. It's not that it's multiplied. I just rewrote explicitly because this is Newton notation. Then I was carried away to to tell you how beautiful is Leibniz notation. You know that the, this, these things were invented by two people at the same time. One was a German Leibniz guy, and the other was Newton. And they argued for a long time who was first. And uh, okay, it doesn't matter. But the fact is that uh, Newt Newton's notation is nice because it's very compact, but Leibniz notation is is more Suggest, suggestive, and it even helps you in, uh, in doing this trick. So, OK. <coughs> so
So you see that uh, I can, uh, if I look at this now, I take the, so look at d dt, for me is, you see, I take L, so let's do this. Uh, I take it 1 over dt, yeah, I, I, I call it 1 over dt is equal to this, and I take it on the other side. So I have L, m r square, d dt theta. That's what I wanted to say. This way, I trade a, a, a derivative with respect to time to a derivative with respect to theta. And so I can plug that in here. The only thing I need is this is the first derivative. So what is the, what is the, the second derivative? Okay? So first I replace by using the conservation uh, of the angular momentum. Uh, this is what I wrote downstairs. Okay, and uh, uh, then I replace this. So I have m l m r square, right? D d uh, theta, but it's the second derivative. So I have again d d t that again I write like m r square d d theta. Okay, and here I have r. So this, this is the second derivative with respect to time, rewritten in a new notation that is a second derivative. But you see, it's a little more complicated because r depends on theta, obviously. So when this goes inside, you have to take care of this term. Then uh, this, this, is, this is fine the way it is. And also this is just whatever it is. So this is my equation for the orbit now. So this was the equation for the trajectory. The one boxed is the equation, uh, the equation, uh, equation for the orbit. And now I can forget and I erase this before I'm arrested. And. Uh, you see, everywhere there is 1 over r, 1 over r. So usually in this business, people call, uh, introduce, uh, they introduce a new variable that they call u that is just 1 over r, OK? And then you should only be careful that du, right, du is minus 1 over r squared dr. And if you do that, the equation so sort of simplify. Because you have, you see, 1 over r. So you, you, you have to replace everywhere r with the, uh, 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 1 over u, uh, sorry, 1 over r with u. And also dr is replaced by du. OK? So what you get is minus l square divided by m. This I'm, I'm writing this term here. I get an extra l u square d d theta d u d theta you see the nice thing about this tra transform i mean is you see that uh, d r you see d d r over r is just minus d u so you see that's what why this transformation is nice uh, and then I have this term here that obviously is just minus L square uh, 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 over M. And then I have 1 over R cubed, so I just have U to the cube. And uh, V, that is a function of R, becomes just a function of uh, U. Okay. So this is the way, this is the equation that you, well, you, you can, uh, this is the form you usually, sometimes it's written, you, you can, 
you see you can simplify u and bring it there so you have a, a nice form for this equation the, the second derivative of u with respect to theta square plus so you multiply ml square you bring it on the other side so plus u is equal minus ml square now you get this extra 1 over u square but you see it's in this form so this is okay if uh, is the v of 1 over u so this is still f so uh, now I have this that looks nice it's the second derivative plus the function itself is equal to whatever this derivative is that I cannot do because I don't know how, how v depends on r it will depend for the Kepler problem is going to be minus k u for uh, harmonic oscillator is going to be something different but it's a second order differential equation and also uh, uh, you see something that maybe was not completely obvious here. Uh, uh, this equation is invariant for the exchange of theta into minus theta, right? Because it only depends on the second derivative uh, of u with respect to theta. So if I change theta into minus theta, nothing is going to happen. So that means that you can all, all these orbits are, are go, all the orbits that I'm going to find solving this equation are going to be symmetric with respect to reflection. In other words, if I give you half of an orbit, uh, you, you, you know already how the other half is. And this is essentially, you know, even if it's like this, right, this is half. If the comet comes this way, then you already know the way it's going to fly away because you just do, it's like in a mirror, right? It's a mirror transformation. And the same if it's a closed orbit, obviously for, for a circle, for a ellipsis, and so on and so forth. In fact, all the orbits we will find uh, are going to satisfy this uh, principle. Uh, and this is, 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 is already there in this uh, form of the equation. Okay, so orbits are, are symmetric about turning points. These are the turning points. This and infinity and so on. Uh, so this is a possibility if you uh, I mean this is not a very simple differential equation I mean uh, this part if, if this if there is zero potential this uh, you recognize what, what, what is the different what is the solution of this differential equation right it's just a trigonometric function but unfortunately you, you have some piece here that you don't know and in general it's not going to be uh, that simple uh, on the other hand, I can look for the trajectories, right? So let me do that and then we stop. So this is a way. I look for the orbit directly if I'm clever enough or if I have Mathematica, this nice program that integrates everything. I, I can plug in my differential equation and find the solutions, okay? And that's what we are going to do on Friday, uh, but uh, uh, so this was the orbit. Uh, I can also pursue the other uh, idea that I want to look for the trajectories. How I'm going to do about that? Well, there uh, it's more effective to use the other trick. That remember is that uh, rather than having to deal with second order differential equations, I'm happier if I have just first order differential equation, right? Uh, it, it looks like uh, less work. So how can I uh, use first order differential equations? Well, I, I go back to my conservation laws. You know that the conservation laws are first integrals of the motion, and that means they, they imply the velocity rather than the acceleration. So if I write my, my two conserve quantity that we have already written, so the energy, m divided by 2 r dot square plus r square theta dot square um, uh, plus the potential. So I'm back, uh, I'm back uh, uh, and this e is a constant, right? Uh, 
and then I use the other one that uh, uh, is just m r square, right? Again, it is just uh, so this term here, just well, I, I can rewrite this like one half m r square plus one half l square m r square plus the potential. Okay, and this is still the energy. So I've used, as before, one of the conserved quantity to get rid of uh, theta dot, and then I'm left with a differential equation now that is just this. And as before, for the potential, I, I only have the velocity. So this I, in principle, know, uh, know how to integrate. Okay, so this is, is one, and the other one is just... So these are the equations. And if I solve them, I, I, I presumably I found r of t and theta of t. That is what I call the trajectories. So that's the other uh, 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 side of the coin. And you see that I can write the solution, right? Because it's rather simple. It's just a, it's a total derivative of r. So I can bring everything on the other side. And write r dot is equal to what? Well, I take everything on the side of the energy. Is what I did before for the potential, right? 2m e minus the potential really is the effective potential because I also have, now I keep it explicitly, this funny term that comes from the, I guess there is a square, that comes from the, And you see that this, this I can integrate, right? If, if you tell me what v this function is, then uh, uh, t, because this is the, let's switch to, so again, uh, uh, I take dt d here, I take this on the other side, and I do the integral, so I have t is equal to what? Initial condition, so the position, the position at time t equal to, I don't know, zero, to the position at which I'm, 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 I'm computing the orbit of this integral, dr, the square root of whatever is here. So 2m e minus vr minus this uh, angular momentum. So presumably, if, if, if vr is a simple enough function, this is the integral that I know that I can find in, the, in that book I suggest you, you, you get hold of, or, or, or through Mathematica. And then you see this, this, this is the solution of this is t as a function of r, r, the energy, and l, and the initial position, right? That's the solution. That's the trajectory. And when, when I, well, uh, actually a trajectory, I have to, one, once I know this, I just uh, invert this and I get R of t, right? So you invert and you get R of t and R0. And of course, the, the energy and the angular momentum. And once I know that, I can integrate this you see, because this is rather simple to integrate as well, because I do the same trick. And I, you see that theta of t is the integral from time t, uh, uh, initial time that uh, I can always speak to be 0, to the time t at which I'm, I'm, I'm uh, L dt of m r square of t plus some initial condition I uh, should have. Here is t0, but this I put it to 0. So, uh, so you see, once I have r of t, the trajectory, I put it here, and I do this integral, I get theta, the, the, theta of t. And I've completely solved the problem. So this is theta of t and the, 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 the initial angle, given the energy and the L even the energy and the angular momentum. OK.
from this expression, I, anyway, I can always go back to the orbit, you understand, right? Because uh, at this stage here, so let me write it here, d, when I write dt, so let me eliminate the integral and write dt, dt, I said, is dr square root of, of, uh, of e minus vr minus L square to M R square, right? But again, I can always use the trick I use for the equation uh, to, to, to get from this the equation of the orbit, because remember, d theta is L t t M R square, right? So you see that from here, I can trade d t for d theta and get L d R M R square, the square root the same thing that is up there. So again, I can go through the other uh, and uh, solve this. this uh, and the solution of this is going to be the orbit. So let's do that, and then I stop for real. So if I integrate this, I get theta, right, as a function of r now. So now we are talking about orbits again. Actually, I like the orbit better than the trajectory in this case. As you see, it's the integral from the initial position to r of dr, right? Then let me take m inside, because you see that I get rid of these m's here. So I have r squared outside. That's OK. And then I have the square root of what? 2me. So I take l and m inside. So I have a L squared down, right? Then 2mv, the potential, divided by L squared. And then I have, a, right, so I'm, I'm, I'm already simplifying a little bit. And now again, remember the substitution that I did for the differential equation. You see, you have dr over r squared. So if I introduce u, this integral, now I change variables to simplify the integral. So, uh, okay, here there is a theta naught because, uh, right, the, so you have theta naught minus now the u naught u. This is the u, so u naught is the, the 1 over r naught. I mean, it's obvious. And now I have du, this minus du takes, takes care of this dr over r square. And then I only need to rewrite, well, 2me over L square is just a constant, so I don't have to be clever. And, 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 and also this, I mean, 2mv, that is a function of u now. And here you just have 1 over R square, that by definition is u square. So again, if I solve, th this is u as a function, theta as a function of r, or theta as a function of u, uh, in this case. So you see that if the potential, now I have to, I mean, that's as far as I can go without telling you what v of r is, clearly. <coughs> Where? Why? No, why? Because du is minus dr r square. So this is du. And then I simply replace. Yeah, but. Where is 2? Uh, two, no, 2me. Two 2me. Two to this? Yes. No, 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 because, uh, uh, so,
You want a two here? Okay, I'll check it. But it shouldn't be there, so I made a mistake somewhere. I think... Uh, uh, I will too. <laughs> okay, but let, let me just keep in this form. That uh, I only wanted to add. Uh, now I have to say something about the potential. Uh, in general, this is a central force, so I can think of the potential as say some co some constant. Okay, then R, and then I can think that uh, okay, it can be any function. Obviously, it can be the sine of R, the exponential e to the minus R over R zero. But let's just consider potential that go like powers uh, or some or some or some exponent, right? So in this form here, where n can 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 vary. And what I wanted to say, you see that if I plug this in here, okay, uh, in here, I have two m e l square minus two m a. L squared, that is just a constant. And here you have u to the minus n minus 1 minus u squared, maybe with a factor of 1 half. It doesn't matter. So you see that uh, you, you have an integral that uh, you should be able to see. It's an integral in the form dx square root of a uh, x squared plus bx plus c, right? If, if, you, if you take my meaning you have an integral that is 1 over the square root of a, of a, uh, <coughs> a quadratic polynomial in u. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, not a quadratic polynomial. A, 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 yeah, here you have uh, the powers, right? Minus n, minus 1. So depending on what n you take, here you have a, a, a quadratic, a cubic, uh, whatever polynomial. What I wanted to say is that uh, uh, you can check on this uh, table of integrals. You know, th these integrals, as I said, they are all, uh, uh, they are all uh, classified, classified in, the, in that book. A and you can find all the possible uh, uh, polynomial there. But the, the fact is that if n, if n, so now the homework can go, if n is equal to 1 minus 2 minus 3, so that means potential that goes like uh, 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 r square, uh, uh, what is that potential? A potential that goes like uh, r square. It's a, the harmonic oscillator, right? Because it's a force that is proportional to the distance. n minus 2, so minus 2 plus 1 minus 1, that's Kepler problem. And also minus 3 plus 1, so 1 over r square, so a sort of super Kepler. Then this integral can be written in terms of trigonometric functions. So the solution of this problem is going to be some uh, combination of this trigonometric function. So 
that's highly non-trivial. So, so we know the solution of this problem exactly. And it, it, it can be written in terms of elementary functions, trigonometric functions, for this case. If n is 5, 3, 0, minus 4, minus 5, minus 7, again, I know the solution. For other values, I don't know the solution. But for these values, I know the solution. But the solution is a little more complicated but can be written in terms, you remember, these elliptic functions that I mentioned uh, uh, with regard to, to uh, the, the pendulum. So these are functions that can be written as a hyper, you, you, you study the hypergeometric function, so uh, you know that if you know the hypergeometric function, you know all these special functions because by choosing the coefficients uh, of the hypergeometric function, you can uh, uh, describe most of the other special functions. So in these cases, so these are potential, I don't know. This is, you see, 5. It's a potential that grows like r to the sixth, whatever. I know the solution is an elliptic uh, function. That means this integral becomes an elliptic integral, the same that I had uh, in the case of the pendulum, when the oscillation is not that simple. But at least for these three cases, and in particular for these two that are the most relevant for us, uh, not only I know the solution, but the solution can be written in terms of elementary functions, meaning functions that you have already met, and that's what we are going to do on Friday, to write this orbit in terms of these elementary functions. Okay? <coughs>